Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Mr. Vivek Goenka, chairman of the group, welcome to the first Ramnath Goenka lecture. At the Indian Express, we invoke our founder's name very sparingly and with utmost care. We are a little scared of him. We believe he's still there. And he doesn't suffer fools. Each night, his uh, spirit shimmers over our newsroom. He nudges us to ask harder questions, to dig deeper, because he always said the best stories lie way below the surface. He pushes us to go where others do not go, where some cannot go, and in some cases will not go. He keeps us on our toes because he knows that as you grow old, it's much more comfortable to go down on bended knee. At a time when all you hear is either, a, is, is either abuse or applause, he tells us that you should, take, you should take both with equal indifference. Listen to every voice, Ramnath Goenka once said, but remember that those who shout the loudest are usually the least interesting because they have long stopped listening to anybody. That is why today, as Seema said, 25 years after his passing, these are the values that we aspire to in our daily journalism. Sure, we do not make it every night, every, you know, sort of every day, there is a big gap between what we want to do and what we do every morning. And every day when, when we come to work, uh, we want to narrow that gap. And that is why there could not be a more appropriate lecturer to start this series than Dr. Raghuram Rajan. <laughs> not just because Shobha Day says he's very sexy, and that's a PG-13 version of what she said. <laughs> or because Dr. Harold James calls him a rock star. But also because central bankers these days, as Dr. James has also said, are today's philosophers. What defines their decision making is not, is not just economics, but belief systems and entire philosophical debates. Just look at the big ideas that he has to deal with every morning. Stimulus versus austerity. Rules versus discretion. Fairness versus equity. The freedom of a market versus what Michael Sandel calls the moral limits of a market. If these debates lie at the heart of policy making, Dr. Rajan is the one who's got the finest ear tuned to that heartbeat because he has the courage as well, both intellectual and moral, to stand up and disagree. As he did in 2005, we all know here, when the world read and many chose not to read his now famous Jackson Hole paper on the horribly skewed nature of incentive and risk in the financial system or his seminal work of how to save capitalism from capitalists, or his explanation on why you need a government to take care of a free market, and the role of, of the government in that. Today, Dr. Rajan is not at the center of these debates. He's shaping them as well. He's constantly reminding us that these ideas impact lives, not just ours, who are lucky ones to be in this room this evening. And this is something that he keeps underlining in whatever he speaks and whatever he writes. Those who will never make it to, this, to a room like this one. I will be remiss in my welcome if I don't mention two, two small footnotes. One, this is the year uh, where it, it also marks 25 years since he got his PhD from MIT. 
one of the key themes of his thesis, and yes, there is a PDF on, online, was the relationship between lenders and borrowers. It is straight from, from the headlines of this week, from, from the headlines of next week, and from the headlines of many, many more weeks to come. The last footnote, and I will end, and I will get in, I'm, I'm getting in the way of this evening, to we are launching this lecture in Delhi, and we thought, while we were talking about, you know, how, how do we do it, that we could spin it as the return of the native. So we got it to rain this morning, and we also, as, as you know, ordered some hailstones uh, for him, because that is the closest we can get to a Chicago winter. So, so Dr. Rajan, for you, he, he, he's basically a Delhi boy. He went to DPS Arkipuram, not far from here, and then he went to the Indian Institute of Technology, which, by the way, if you take the Delhi metro and the yellow line, it shares the same stop as JNU. <laughs> I feel, I... I feel, and this is just a feeling, that Ramnath Goenkaji would have loved this coincidence. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Raghuram Raja. Mr. Goenka, both former and current, uh, Mr. Jha, Mr. Vigramji, my former boss, Mr. Chidambaram, uh, Ms. Ishar Judge Aluwalia and other distinguished guests in the audience. Um, it gives me great pleasure to deliver this first Ramnath Goenka lecture. As you know, Sri Goenka was a freedom fighter who built the Indian Express into a national newspaper. In his time, it was arguably the best investigative newspaper in the country. I won't comment on which one is the best one now for fear of upsetting some sensibilities. Uh, he was instrumental in highlighting the excesses of the emergency, which uh, probably contributed to uh, Ms. Indira Gandhi's defeat when she lifted it. He continued to be a tireless scourge of corruption and government high-handedness and was responsible for unsettling many a minister and business tycoon. Probably befitting in a lecture in his memory to speak about the efforts that India has been making on increasing transparency and curbing corruption. However, I've said what I needed to on that elsewhere, and uh, there's a lot of commentary anyway in, uh, in the press today. Instead, what I want to do is speak on India's engagement with the global economy and how best to manage it in these turbulent times. Now, as you know, the global economy hasn't been growing uh, particularly fast. In fact, the IMF every year starts out with optimistic uh, expectations of growth and through the year keeps revising it downwards and this has been happening for the last three or four years. So why has the recovery uh, been so slow and how should we deal with it? Well, first the answer to why the recovery has been so slow is a matter of great debate. There are some people who say it's because uh, the world took on too much debt in the lead up to the financial crisis and that debt is serving as an overhang. Uh, households in the US have too much debt, aren't willing to spend. Corporations uh, in Europe, in India have too much debt, can't invest. And of course banks have too little capital and can't lend. And this, sort of, this combined with governments uh, running out of fiscal space because they've borrowed too much, all ends up in, uh, in uh, very slow growth. So the remedy for this is typically to write down the debt, to um, say that this is unsustainable and has to be written down. The problem, of course, is it becomes politically very difficult to do it, and uh, large-scale debt write-offs typically require national consensus and typically don't happen because everybody's wondering who gets the benefits and who pays for it. But I think the other thing to think about is that why was there so much debt buildup before the crisis? Why did you know Spain, Portugal, 
the United States, uh, all these countries go overboard. And today, of course, China has gone overboard over the last four or five years in borrowing. Why has this happened? And perhaps the answer is that really the debt, uh, the debt fueled spending before hides a fall in global potential growth. The growth actually has fallen for different reasons. And in an attempt to keep growth up across the world, there was overspending, whether by households or by governments. Now, what could these factors be? One very important factor that uh, certainly Ruchir Sharma has started talking about is population aging. That across the industrial world, populations have been growing older. In fact, in a number of countries, Japan to begin with, the working age population is actually shrinking. The labor force is shrinking which means growth, unless you have very strong productivity growth, is going to fall. Uh, but combined with this is the fact that productivity growth has not been increasing. And this is something that people wonder about. Why in this world where there's so much innovation, so much technology, so much talk about Google, about, uh, about Facebook and so on, do we find that productivity growth is so miserable? And here again, there are lots of debates about what's really going on. Some people say, we're actually not measuring it. You're much better off than you think. Um, you know, you don't spend your evenings going to a movie theater anymore. You basically, you know, spend your time on, on the computer, see all the movies you want, uh, travel all the newspapers you want without paying for them. And so essentially, you have a better life today, but it's not being monetized, not being captured in the GDP numbers. So that's one version of it. Uh, another version of it is what Robert Gordon has been talking about in his most recent book, but of course in a number of papers before, which is, you know, the kind of advances represented by Facebook and, uh, and Twitter are really tiny compared to what happened in the past, uh, in the not so, not so distant past. For example, think of the motor car, uh, the advent of the motor car relative to the horse-drawn carriage. That was a huge advance. The advent of the aeroplane, the advent of, uh, of uh, the telegraph or the telephone, those were huge advances compared to you know, the 140 characters on Twitter. Uh, those are relatively minor. Yes, you can communicate better, but you still could communicate through the telephone in real time in the past. So the point here is that maybe you know, productivity growth is not showing up because there isn't any. Uh, relative to the past, and the, the, the counter camp says, yeah, no, 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 productivity growth is there, we're not monetizing it, we're not measuring it. Uh, be that as it may, the point is the measured GDP growth numbers are really very low in industrial countries, and um, so what do you do to, to increase the rate of growth? Because there's so much demand for growth, there are so many young people coming into the labor force, uh, unemployment rates uh, in some some categories are close to 50 percent. A lot of angst, and uh, angst, of course, creates eventually people walking out on the street and social conflict. Certainly, some of what we are seeing in the elections in uh, the United States and elsewhere uh, reflect some of this concern. Now, the economists would say do structural reforms. That is, uh, basically, uh, do the things that up the rate of growth uh, because they make uh, the country more productive. Uh, problem, as uh, uh, I keep uh, repeating this classic phrase of Jean-Claude Juncker, the former Luxembourg Prime Minister, w which was, you know, in the face of all the structural reforms that uh, he knew uh, they had to do, he said, um, at the height of the Euro crisis, we all know what to do, we just don't know how to get re-elected after we do it. So uh, that's, uh, that's the problem with structural reforms. They tend to upset constituencies. Why? Because the costs are immediate. The costs are well-defined. They hit. I mean, think of Uber coming in. The taxi driver who loses his job to Uber knows fully well what's happened. But all the possible Uber drivers in the future who are going to have different livelihoods, part-time jobs, etc., don't yet know they're going to be Uber drivers. So there's a well-defined constituency which opposes it, the taxi drivers who have current jobs. There's an ill-defined constituency which doesn't know whether to support it or not, all the potential people, uh, including the users who could benefit. Now, what this means, and this was a talk I just gave uh, at the IMF uh, conference, 
uh, is that countries are engaging because the clear paths for growth they cannot adopt. The, uh, they're engaging in more and more aggressive monetary policy. We've seen uh, increasingly innovative acronyms uh, increasingly innovative actions. We moved into negative interest rates and it's getting more negative over time. Now, what this, this does to a country like ours is it creates volatility. It creates volatility because uh, we experience significant shifts in the exchange rate as a result of some of these actions. Some of you who are market watchers know what happened when China moved its exchange rate in August and again in January. Uh, but, but not only does it create volatility uh, as far as the exchange rate goes, it sort of creates waves of capital going in and waves of capital going out, not at the time of our choosing, not based on our fundamentals, but based on activities elsewhere. And so one of the important things to emphasize uh, to countries abroad is they have to wo worry about the spillover effects of their actions on countries like ours, and they can be uh, pretty substantial. So we are effectively in a somewhat manic depressive global environment where the investor wakes up in the morning and says, should I be optimistic, uh, risk on mode as some people in the market call it, or should I be pessimistic and risk off? In the pessimistic mode, every emerging market looks bad. Uh, you highlight all the downside problems in these markets, the political difficulties, etc. Uh, and in your optimistic mode, everything looks wonderful, growth is going to go on forever at 7-8%. So given this, what should we as a country do in the face of this kind of uncertainty? And, and what I would emphasize is we need macroeconomic stability. That has to be the platform on which we, we, build, we'll, we, we build growth. And I think that platform has been in the building for some time now. Uh, we started with an emphasis on fiscal prudence when uh, Mr. Chidambaram came back into the finance ministry in 2012. And uh, that path has continued. Uh, the current budget emphasizes the need to adhere to the fiscal consolidation path, even while allocating resources to capital spending and focusing on structural reforms, especially in agriculture. So with this, uh, I think the fall in the bond yields that followed on the budget announcements suggested that the budget had an in extremely important effect in calming market investors with the government's overall message. What we can also argue is that ever since the days we had large current account deficits in the early, in the 2012-2013 period, fiscal consolidation has also helped narrow the current account deficit. And uh, today we have a current account deficit which is fully financed by foreign direct investment. In fact, overfinanced by the foreign direct investment that is coming in. Um, as you know, inflation is also down since the days of double-digit CPI inflation. Uh, we have today an inflation-focused monetary framework, which I believe will be strengthened by the constitution of the Monetary Policy Committee, which has been mooted in the finance bill. So while I personally, as RBI governor, can no longer will no longer be able to set monetary policy unilaterally. I believe the shifting of the power uh, to a committee is absolutely in the economy's interest. Not only will a committee aggregate multiple views better than any single individual, uh, it will also offer more continuity. If one person in the committee moves off, it won't change policy overnight. If a governor uh, changes, it won't shift policy overnight. And moreover, a committee will be less subject to the pushes and pulls and the influence and pressure that typically fall on central banks. So I believe that the monetary reforms that have been undertaken by this government will be an important and signal achievement. Uh, of course, it has been some time in the making. The last leg of the stabilization agenda is to clean up the stressed assets in the banking sector so that banks have the room to lend again. Now, the, this has been a problem that has built up over time, and part of the problem is the banks didn't have enough power to get promoters to pay or to put the stressed assets back on track. They didn't have the right kinds of tools. 
And unlike a more developed country, we didn't have a functioning bankruptcy system. Now, bankruptcy systems work either by taking the borrower into bankruptcy or working as a threat by which the borrower agrees to out-of-court settlements, knowing that if that doesn't happen, the borrower gets dragged through the bankruptcy court. Now, without a bankruptcy court, neither was, was possible. What we've been doing over time is to give the banks the powers so that effectively they can carry out an out-of-court resolution with the, with the borrower and put the stressed or stranded assets back on track. The primary importance for the country is the assets come back on track and start producing uh, either power or, uh, or steel or whatever. Uh, of course, we need to pin blame where blame, blame belongs. And if there was malfeasance, certainly malfeasance that was undertaken should be punished. However, let us separate the two. The asset is, itself is not a malfeasant asset. The asset itself is blameless. Put the asset back on track. Put the company that has been uh, created back on track and let the course of the law follow where it will on dealing with the, uh, with the problems. Now, you know, by and large, there are a whole variety of reasons why assets have got into trouble. Uh, bad luck, bad structuring, over-indebtedness, over-optimism. Remember, all this was happening on the back of very strong seven, six, seven years of very strong growth since 2003. So there are lots of reasons apart from malfeasance, either on the side of the lender or on the side of the borrower. So let us be very careful that we don't taint every, every problem with the same brush. And let us also be careful that going forward, uh, we allow bankers to make reasonable decisions and to lend because this country absolutely needs a system that works in terms of lending to finance growth. Now, um, our intent, uh, let me end that with saying that our intent is to have clean and fully provisioned bank balance sheets by March 2017, and uh, we are uh, on our way there. Um, perhaps the most important difficulty in an argumentative society like India's is to persuade the public uh, of your point of view, in this case, the need for macroeconomic stability when growth is below expectation. So I started off by saying the world is growing slowly, lots of impatience in other countries. Same problem in India, that we're growing slowly relative to our expectations of what is possible. And therefore, it's very hard to persuade people that, you know, let's focus on macroeconomic stability. Growth will come. We're not saying don't grow, but let's not emphasize growth at the expense of macroeconomic stability. Uh, the constant call from the, from the commentators who oppose this uh, is, is sort of paraphrasing uh, uh, St. Augustine, uh, Lord, give us stability, but not just yet. So uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, an, it's basically, let's go for growth now, worry about stability later. Um, you know, usually they, they call on you to not be doctrinaire, because after all, only academic economists care about fiscal deficits. To be practical, uh, does it really matter if an NPA is recognized in a quarter or three? Um, you know, does it really matter? And to appreciate Indian realities. Everyone may say they hate inflation, but no one wants to really bear the pain of the disinflationary process. So these are all the advice you get. You know, uh, hang loose, uh, don't be too focused on, uh, on macro stability. Uh, let's, uh, let's just uh, uh, stimulate till we get growth back. And I think that's a dangerous path. I think that's a dangerous path. It's a path that has been followed by others and we have seen where they have reached. Uh, you just have to look at our fellow BRIC countries to understand that probably our path is, is, is a little more stable than what others have been doing, because they have different environmental conditions they've had to deal with. Um, I do want to emphasize, and this is important for our foreign, uh, foreign uh, visitors, uh, that given the inhospitable world economy, and two successive droughts in India, either of which we should have thrown the economy into a tailspin in the past, um, macroeconomic stabilization must be part of the reason why we have over 7% growth, low inflation, and a low current account deficit, why we stand out. Let us not sneer at this level of growth, 
given what is happening elsewhere in the world, and given that our strongest growth was achieved when we had both agriculture going for us, rural demand going for us, and most importantly, the global economy going for us. And we, we tend to neglect that, we tend to forget that. This is pretty good growth, and, and I hope uh, and believe it will become stronger as we build on this sound base. Now, I want to talk specifically uh, as we go forward, building on this base, how we engage with the, with the global economy. And uh, let me start uh, first with, uh, uh, with one uh, worrying factor in, global, in the global economy, which is that trade used to grow faster than um, global output. Uh, and in the last few years, it has been growing more slowly. Trade has been growing more slowly. There are a number of explanations. One pretty obvious explanation is that as countries get richer, they tend to consume more services. Services tend to be non-traded. I don't, I don't trade a haircut. Somebody from the US can't give me a haircut, but they can certainly send me uh, Apple iPhones. And so as we move more towards services, Apple iPhones is a bad uh, example, cars. Uh, <laughs> Uh, we do import a lot of iPhones, but cars, US cars, we don't import very many. Uh, but, so services, uh, as we use more of them, there'll be less trade. Um, also, what we've seen in the last few years is uh, capital goods investment has fallen off in the world. And capital goods investment tends also to be highly trade intensive. You import a lot of your capital goods from countries like Japan, from, uh, from countries like Japan, China, Germany, and that's also fallen off. And um, Finally, and this is probably most worrisome, uh, which is that as um, industrial countries become technologically more advanced in flexible manufacturing, and as they become more competitive post-financial crisis, um, a lot more of their global supply chains are being drawn, drawn inward into their own country. They're pulling in no longer relying on long supply chains across countries. This is also happening with China, which is doing much more of its value added internally rather than buying in. China used to be the assembler for the world. That's changing tremendously. China is now becoming the source of value added. Global supply chains are contracting significantly. The point to take away from this, therefore, is that Indian trade is likely to be muted for some time. Okay, and that's what this uh, this uh, this graph is showing, that our exports of goods and services has been coming down. Of course, a lot of us feel the pain and say India is spe doing specially badly. But if you look at this graph, it's hard to tell that India is that different from the uh, fall in trade of emerging markets. Emerging markets in general are doing badly, and this is a global phenomenon. Uh, perhaps more focused on emerging markets, but certainly it is the case that trade is, is, is falling off. Now, um, there are some nuances when we look at trade in, in goods. We're doing a little worse when you look at the last few quarters in trade in goods, that is manufactured goods. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at trade in services, uh, we're doing a little better, perhaps because the areas we export to, such as the United States, are starting to pick up more strongly. But the broader point I want you to take away is that uh, we're not alone in suffering a fall in trade. A number of our emerging market cousins are also uh, uh, suffering a fall in trade. Uh, and this is why, I mean, it's important to look out. Uh, we always think India's uh, sui generis is, is, is one of its kind. And what happens to us doesn't happen anywhere else. Uh, but we must remember this is more a global phenomenon. And therefore, when we think about what we must do, we have to think about remedies which would attack the global problem rather than think about country-specific remedies which may not help in the lar larger run. So um, while, uh, you know, for example, when we're looking at our poorer export performance, uh, we could uh, examine possible dumping in certain industries uh, we have to be careful about it, because that may give that particular industry relief, uh, but it may increase the cost of inputs for another industry in the country which depends on inputs from that country. So we have to make sure that prices 
that increase in the protected industry doesn't make another industry uncompetitive. And, and that's why we have to be careful at these times of slowing trade. Now, another potential concern at these times that people express is trade is slowing, but it's because the exchange rate is overvalued. Okay, now, it can't be true that all the emerging markets, the exchange rate is overvalued, and all of them have been suffering a fall in, uh, in trade. But let's examine the exchange rate and uh, ask the usual questions that my friend Surjit Palla here would, would ask about uh, the exchange rate. The, the point, uh, I think that's, that's clear, uh, is that uh, the stability of our currency uh, has meant uh, that uh, we have depreciated some against the dollar, which has, uh, has been a strong currency. About, uh, uh, if you look at this particular chart, it's about 6%. Uh, since about uh, uh, the 1st of January 2015, uh, which about reflects uh, largely the inflation differential with the United States. Um, so we've de depreciated about 6% against the dollar, but other currencies have depreciated even more against the dollar. If you look at the real, the ruble, uh, the peso, the Argentinian peso, number of countries have depreciated more. So from a competitiveness perspective, what is important is, have we depreciated more or less than our competitor economies, right? And therefore, economists would say, let's look at the nominal effective exchange rate, which compares the rupee's value against other exchange rates, weighing each by their share in trade. And that's, that's what I do in the next uh, uh, chart. And this is India's nominal effective exchange rate uh, calculated in two ways. Essentially, what this says is since around the beginning of 2015, it has been relatively fat, flat. Now, you could say it was appreciating since 2013, August, but remember that was a time of great disequilibrium during the taper tantrum when our exchange rate plummeted. And then we stabilized, and so much of that movement upwards could be the stabilization. Over the last year, it has generally been flat, a nominal effective exchange rate. We've weakened against the dollar, we have strengthened against the euro. One of my problems of often when I read the press commentary on our exchange rate is there'll be a lot of, uh, uh, you know, breast beating about, oh, we're reaching a low against the dollar. But if the dollar is reaching a high against everybody else, uh, we may be quite, quite reasonable. And that's what this graph is showing, that from nominal effective terms, even though you may feel we are close to a low point in the rupee dollar exchange rate at about 67, that in fact, uh, we have been flat for some time. Now, this is where Surjit will say that, you know, don't worry about the nominal effective exchange rate, worry about the real effective exchange rate. And let me explain to our non-economist friends what that means. Uh, let's say a widget cost a dollar to make a year ago in the United States. A year ago it cost a dollar to make in the United States, and it cost 63 rupees in India to make that widget. Now, given the dollar-rupee exchange rate a year ago was about 63, you would say India was competitive at that point. 63 rupees it cost to make the widget, cost a dollar in the U.S., cost the same in both countries translating at the exchange rate to make that widget. Now, supposing India has 5% inflation and supposing the U.S. has 0% inflation. Now, if the exchange rate remained the same, what would happen is India would become uncompetitive, right? Because costs have gone up by 5%. So the cost of making the widget in India now is 66.2. The cost of making the widget in the US still remains 63 because they make it at a dollar. Dollars worth 63 rupees. And so with the exchange rate remaining the same, essentially they can make it cheaper than we can make it. So if your currency remains the same, but you're inflating at a higher rate than the rest of the world, you suffer what is called real appreciation and you become increasingly uncompetitive. What is needed is your currency should depreciate at the rate at which uh, the inflation differentials are. That is, that is standard uh, economics. And by the way, for people in the press, I'm not advocating a depreciation of the rupee. <laughs> Sometimes these phrases are taken out of context, and uh, and uh, and uh, this is not this is not anything normative. This is just a, a statement of fact. Uh, so this is what the real effective exchange rate looks like for the rupee. Uh, that again, taking into account inflation differentials, 
uh, we have remained again about relatively flat since, uh, uh, since the beginning of uh, 2015. Of course, again, we have appreciated since that low, which we reached in uh, the taper tantrum in, in uh, August of 2013, but uh, we have remained relatively flat. Now, um, sort of, uh, this chart also reflects the fact that, uh, um, you know, uh, the truth is in the eye of the beholder. If somebody wants to complain about the rupee being a source of overvaluation, and I have some commentator friends in the press who actually say that, they point to the low there and say, from there to now, there's a 20% appreciation of the rupee. So there's a 20% appreciation of the rupee, therefore the rupee is overvalued. Of course, somebody who wants to say that's not why trade is falling off would point to the flat region and say, for the last year and, a, and some, it's been relatively flat. Can't be that that's the primary reason. Then we could have a debate about lags in, in, in exports and so on. Uh, let's not go there. Let me just say that there's another reason to believe that exchange rates aren't the reason that, uh, uh, that, that one has to worry um, about our slower export growth, and that is uh, uh, productivity differentials. Now, for a country like India, where we are growing because we are learning to do things better, or we are doing things better, and by this I don't mean uh, new processes, cleverer processes necessarily. That's one source by which you do things more efficiently, things to do things better. But supposing you improve a road, uh, to the port. Supposing you improve the time it takes to put cargo onto the ship. Uh, supposing you build cranes instead of uh, the mazdoor taking, uh, taking the load on his back. All these are productivity improvements in a poor country because we are getting closer to the productivity possibility frontier. In a country like the US or Germany where you already have cranes doing all the work, where the roads are autobahns which are perfectly empty most of the time, where you can grow, go really fast and you can't actually go faster with existing technology, you are at the frontier. So it's perfectly possible for the world, which was a complaint I talked about earlier, to be having very low productivity growth and for India to have significantly higher productivity growth. And the nice thing about exchange rates, real exchange rates, is to look at competitiveness, you have to subtract from the real exchange rate appreciation the extent to which you have a productivity differential with respect to the rest of the world. If you are more productive on an annual basis than the rest of the world, you can afford some exchange rate appreciation. And in fact, this is the basis of the famous Balasa samuelson theorem, which is one part of the reason why poor countries get rich. They get rich because their real exchange rate appreciates as productivity in their industry gets, gets stronger. So this is a long-winded way of saying that don't worry about the exchange rate. It's broadly in the right place. Um, you know, one can debate a little bit up, a little bit down. Um, the, uh, however, there still is a, a group, uh, a very respectable group, uh, which says it doesn't matter whether it's broadly in the right place. Why don't you, RBI, press a button and make it 10% cheaper? And if you press that button and make it 10% cheaper, our exporters will have a wonderful time and that is going to be great for the country. Now, it's generally economists who advocate a depreciated exchange rate. Most of the uh, uh, public would typically like a stronger rupee because not only does it convey national strength, uh, but also you can buy more stuff abroad with that rupee. Uh, imports are cheaper, your cost of your son's education is, uh, is cheaper. So uh, what this reflects is the fact that non-economists are generally consumer focused and look at the cost to a consumer of a depreciated rupee. Of course, the economist takes the very same arguments and says this is why we should depreciate the exchange rate. Because you're sending your kids abroad, instead of sending them to the fine schools here, why don't you send them here instead? You would if you found the foreign degree unaffordable. If the rupee was so cheap relative to the dollar, you wouldn't be able to pay for a dollar education. You would educate your kids here. And varieties of that, you would spend less on foreign goods, you'd spend more on domestic goods. That would encourage the domestic economy. Clearly, economists 
are producer focused rather than consumer focused. Now, um, the problem, of course, is even while the producer focused argument sounds interesting and sounds uh, entrancing, uh, there is, if, if I did press this button and depreciate the exchange rate by 10%, there is a, a subsidy which is being given to the domestic producers in terms of, uh, uh, of a cheaper exchange rate, but who pays for that subsidy? That subsidy is paid for by domestic consumers and savers. And so the countries that have managed to do this over a sustained long period of time are also countries which had have had limited democratic movements which where uh, the producers have been much stronger in able to suppress the exchange rate and achieve financial repression, giving savers low returns, uh, even while they saved enormous amounts. Uh, in our country, would it be possible, even if we could press this button, to force the consumer to pay artificially high prices for foreign goods, to receive an artificially low interest rate for their savings over a sustained period of time, because that artificially low interest rate is absolutely needed to um, reduce the carrying cost of the enormous foreign exchange reserves which you would have to build up in order to keep the exchange rate depreciated. In other words, if you start on this path, it takes a lot of national will to do it, and it implies a degree of repression of the consumer and the saver, which we really have to think about whether our country can do it. But forget all this, there's a yet another cost which we're seeing. And that cost is that over the long run, if a country makes investments based on an artificially undervalued exchange rate, it makes the wrong kind of investments. And you can see this happening in the turmoil that is happening to the north of us in China, where a whole horde of industries have come up which are absolutely uncompetitive at a reasonable exchange rate, which is why you have overcapacity that has been built up in, in China. Uh, it's certainly, one could argue, that this also reflects the experience of Japan in the 1990s, when a whole host of industries, as the Japanese exchange rate came into equilibrium, a whole host of industries turned out to be greatly uncompetitive. So whether, you know, we're again going back to the let's be happy today and be sad tomorrow, whether we're willing to do that, again, is something that we have to ask ourselves. The bottom line that I would argue is the ideal exchange rate for us is neither strong nor weak. It is just right. Okay. And uh, typically, market forces get you to this Goldilocks rate. Um, but we must be aware that markets aren't perfect. There are circumstances when rapid capital inflows or outflows can move the rate to a level that is likely to be unsupported by fundamentals. Now, as a central bank, I don't claim that we know precisely what the right equilibrium level of the exchange rate is at any given point in time. But what we do is we intervene to moderate adjustment whenever we believe the movement in the exchange rate is driven by sentiment likely to be reversed or driven by extreme flows which are unlikely to persist. Our intent here is not to find a level to press a button and say this is the right level. Our intent is to prevent overshooting and undue volatility rather than stand in the way of needed adjustment of the exchange rate to market forces. Now, um, this is in day-to-day -day affairs. We have also seen in that first chart that I showed you of currency depreciation across the world, some currencies have depreciated 40, 50 percent, the ruble, uh, the Brazilian real. Now, that may also be an example of overshooting when temporarily irrationality in the market overwhelms the central bank. Much like a bank run, when you have a falling currency, foreign investors may dump that currency in an attempt to get out before they lose everything, and you can have a significant fall in the currency, which may be experienced by these countries. So what do we do to maintain the orderly movement of the currency? Three ingredients. One, of course, is the good macro stabilization policies that I talked about. Once you have good policies, people look at them and believe broadly that their money is relatively safe. It's not going to uh, get destroyed in the short term and they're willing to stay longer term. 
Second is we have focused on attracting stable capital flows that will stay for the longer run. And this means, this is important, it means avoiding temptation. A lot of countries have opened up to hot flows because they feel they're the flavor of the moment. They feel uh, you get foreign investment banks coming in every day and saying, open us, you'll get $10 billion tomorrow, you'll get $5 billion, and people buy that and open up. And what happens is this money comes in quickly for a short time, but when your fundamentals change a little or when the global environment changes, it runs out. So one of the things we've tried to do is move the inflows towards the longer run. Not short-term flows, longer run flows. Uh, we prevent reinvestment in, uh, in uh, rupee bonds of less than three years. And we also uh, try and encourage um, our foreign commercial borrowings now to move to the longer end, uh, especially if the borrower who's taking those borrowings doesn't have foreign exchange earnings. We've also started moving towards borrowing in rupees outside. We want to encourage the masala bond a, a, an attempt to borrow in rupees outside rather than borrowing dollars so that the foreign exchange risk is held by the outside rather than by our, our corporations. And, and finally, and this has been an encouraging offshoot of the Make in India campaign, a sizable increase in foreign direct investment has happened. Uh, if you look uh, the uh, uh, months till January of this financial year, we've had close to the we have certainly had the largest increase in foreign direct investment uh, in, our, in our history, approaching uh, what we reached in 2008, 2009, but with still two months left to go in the year. So uh, I think this is a good sign. This is significantly above our, uh, our external deficit, our current account deficit, and that suggests that we are generally a relatively stable country. Um, the bottom line for our policy towards foreign capital flows is one of steady liberalization, where we try and not be tempted by cheap finance, but try and attract risk-bearing capital into our country, capital that will provide us the equity buffers, the risk-bearing buffers that we don't have in this country, that our middle-class investors don't necessarily uh, want to provide. And uh, we intend to give foreign investors decent returns, and to continuously ease and increase their entry and exit in uh, possibilities from the country. Finally, our third line of defense, first was good policy, second was increase the maturity of flows and make them more stable. Third line of defense is our exchange reserves. Uh, we intervene in exchange markets to smooth volatility and typically buy and sell uh, uh, at uh, different times in the year. So it's not unidirectional in any way. So, uh, I've said the exchange rate tool is unlikely to be a helpful tool in our quest to increase uh, what we make in India for the rest of the world. So how should we export more? What, what are the ways to increase uh, exports? And I would say the answer is simple. The answer is improve product productivity by building out infrastructure, improving human capital with better schools, colleges, vocational and on-the-job training, simplify business regulation and taxation, and improve access to finance. Fortunately, all this is what the government and the central bank are focused on. So given there are no easy solutions but a, 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 a path which uh, will, will take time, I'm often asked uh, what industry should we focus on? What should we encourage as we, uh, as we push exports? And I would say anybody who learns from our past uh, would reach the conclusion, let us not encourage anything, that might be the surest way to kill it. So we have to be very careful about picking industries to support. Uh, instead, let us, let us create a good business environment that can support any kind of activity, and then let our fantastic entrepreneurs, of which we have increasing numbers every day, let them figure out what is new and interesting, and what businesses they will create. I mean, just to give you a sense of how hard it is to focus on which industry to pick, remember that, um, you know, Pandit Nehru created the IITs uh, in order to supply engineers largely to the commanding heights of the economy, which was uh, occupied by the public sector. But in the 1990s, instead of supplying the commanding heights, what uh, the IITs did was supplied body shops. 
And I'm sure any government official looking at where the bulk of the IITNs were getting jobs would sneer at this and say, what are these body shops doing Y2K stuff for, uh, for, the, uh, for Western uh, firms? But these very body shops are evolving into our world-beating software giants, the Infosys's, the TCS's, and the Wipro's of the world. There wasn't a huge amount of thought into how this would happen and chalking out the path. It happened. Uh, the government was not unimportant. It was extremely important in creating the basic talent pool in this country by enabling the IITs, by the IITians going to work for many public sector firms and then going to work for private sector firms or starting their own firm. But the broader point is, let us not put too much design into this. Let us enable business activity and see what happens. Now, I've gone on for a, a fair amount of time. Let me uh, uh, mention one last thing before ending. Um, one other important area, I've talked about good services, etc., but one very important area of engagement with the world that we need to build on is ideas and analysis. Uh, what do I mean by this? Today we have a seat at most international tables. Many countries want to draw us into multilateral and bilateral tr treaties. Now, when we were unimportant, we used to rail against the proposals that were inimical to us, the proposals that were skewed against us, knowing fully well that it would not make an iota of difference, that the proposal would get passed, passed anyway. Now, as we get more power, uh, we need to develop the capability of using it more effectively. What do I mean by this? Today, it still is an unfortunate reality that international meets are still dominated by the old powers. But it's not as much through brute uh, power of their votes or whatever that they dominate, but it is through the power of the ideas they bring to the table, the agenda setting that they engage in, and the organizational structures that they both dominate as well as create. Today in the G20, I would say that much of the agenda is still set by elements of the old G7. And often we find that they've agreed on their preferred approach by the time they come to the table or by the time we are called to the table. It is only when they disagree, when the big powers disagree, that the rest of us have some hope of influencing outcomes. But the fault is not in the power structure, the fault is in us. Because unless we amongst the emerging world put forward our agenda, build the intellectual and analytical basis for pushing it, and create the variety of coalitions, perhaps with other emerging markets, perhaps with some of the industrial countries, to support it, we have no hope of moving forward. It doesn't matter how much quota increase we get, it's going to be minuscule relative to what we need. So what is encouraging is today this is starting to happen. The BRICS do discuss policy issues and do try and develop common approaches, but we need to do this on a much larger scale. We need to build coalitions with sympathetic industrial countries, and this can be policy by policy. Some policies, uh, some industrial country would agree with us, other policies, others will. So for this, we need more market intelligence. Who's thinking which way, who's going to work with us? In, a, in India, we need to build capacity in our think tanks, in our universities, to inform our policy makers on how to approach the international policy agenda. We are looking for ideas in the Reserve Bank, certainly uh, when I was working uh, with Mr. Chidambaram in the government. These are places which are eager for ideas, uh, and we need to be prepared when we negotiate bilateral and multilateral treaties so that we don't wake up too late to the fact that we've given away the house with very little in return. Uh, with careful analysis, with preparation, with engagement, with coalition building, I have no doubt, without any increase in our current power in international organizations, we will be able to influence the international agenda more than we are not now. I'm not saying we are entirely uninfluential. We'll be able to do more. But equally important, we'll stop being seen as an obstructionist, but ultimately powerless country that we may have been in the past. We will be seen as a serious player. Let me conclude. Uh, Sri Ramnath Goenka focused on unearthing th facts that would help move the public debate forward. Uh, all too often, as you well know, our public debates generate more noise than illumination, and uh, we should learn from the example that he set. Um, as we cope with the global slowdown and as we frame our policies going forward, uh, we do need a public debate about what our policy path will be based on facts, empirical analysis, and sound arguments. 
Uh, I have laid out a particular view, and you, you, many of you will surely disagree with that view, but I look forward to alternative viewpoints and to evidence uh, that, will, that will show the, um, uh, the, the misconceptions in my ways. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Rajan. That was heard with rapt attention and your permission. May I request Mr. Sunil Jain, the Managing Editor of the Financial Express, to steer this part of the session, please. Governor, um, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, when you began, uh, Raj Kamal Jha tried to tempt you by talking about you know, how IIT and JNU were you know, on the same yellow line of the metro. So he basically wanted to get you to perhaps answer a question that if you were the head of the Chicago Booth School and you know people started insulting the American flag or talking about America, what would you do? You know? So I think Raj was trying to do that. I don't want to do that. I want to actually get you on something uh, economic. You see, we've, you raised the issue of NPAs and how, you're, you know, how the government and you together are trying to address them. The question here is that we've had the Supreme Court saying that how do you lend to a person who was a defaulter? You had the finance minister in parliament saying to Mr. Azad that actually these Kingfisher NPAs happened, I mean the loans happened during your tenure, you guys lent too much, and an NPA was actually restructured you know, at that point. So, the, and you alluded to this in your talk, the, the feeling that one is getting is that the government wants the CBI and investigating agencies to be looking at some of these loans. If you were actually in the finance ministry or somewhere in the government, would you be saying that there was a problem in the Kingfisher loan that they should be looked at? Or would you say, as you said, there was enthusiasm, the world was growing at a certain rate, India was growing at a certain rate, and therefore, bad. I mean, you know, things just went bad. So, a very specific question: What would you do on Kingfisher? <laughs> uh, let, let, let me start with the metro point. Uh, uh, you know, uh, when I was at IIT, uh, we didn't have a metro. It was, uh, and uh, we had two different bus stops. <laughs> so, let let me leave it there. Uh, on the on the issue of uh, uh, of I look uh, as as a central banker, it's not uh, reasonable for me to talk about specific cases. Uh, let me say the following: that um, in general, uh, there are a variety of reasons why loans have gone bad. And if you say that every bad loan indicates malfeasance uh, and requires a full-fledged uh, investigation by the criminal authorities. Uh, let me assure you, going to kill, kill both lending and entrepreneurship in this country immediately. So uh, I don't think we want to go there. Uh, I don't think it's right either. I think uh, a lot of sensible entrepreneurs, uh, buoyed by the euphoria of the pre-financial crisis times when we were growing at uh, eight nine percent for a few years. Uh, and buoyed by the success of their previous enterprises, where with moderate amounts of equity they delivered on power projects, etc., uh, essentially structured it in a much more optimistic way than they should have. Hindsight is 2020. Now we say these are the things that you uh, you 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 did wrong. Uh, let us be careful that we don't use the benefit of hindsight to uh, figure out what uh, what uh, you know. Um, should have been done. I think that's very dangerous. I would say that we do want to go after malfeasance. Absolutely. I don't think there's any space to allow uh, malfeasance uh, and, and rip the taxpayer off via the public sector. But how do you do that based on what you're saying? You're saying keep, you know, be careful but go after malfeasance? No, no. So is that is where it's a very delicate line. It is a very delicate line, has to be approached with a lot of sensitivity. That you do have to go after cases where there's a clear evidence of malfeasance. This requires putting people who understand, uh, including bankers who understand, bankers of integrity, to ferret out these situations. And don't just point the finger when a go loan goes bad, have evidence that money changed hands. 
uh, or, or at least uh, a, a preponderance of evidence, I'm not a lawyer, so pardon the terms, they don't, may not reflect legal, legal terms, you have to be careful. Uh, at the same time, you can't have somebody laughing their way to the bank and saying, I built the system, I'm fine. Somebody who owns multiple flats uh, in the poshest places abroad and has whisked away the money, uh, that cannot possibly be, and I'm not talking about any specific person, these are general terms. <laughs> Uh, these are general terms, but you have to be careful that uh, uh, you know that you follow through uh, where you can. Uh, just before I open it up to the audience, a quick question, without naming names: If a person had a lot of flats abroad, would you would you stop that person from going abroad just because he hadn't paid a bank loan? No. Uh, let's be careful again. Let's be careful. There is a law governing these. Yeah. So would you stop this and, person? And the law should be allowed to operate. If there is evidence of malfeasance, by all means the law should intervene at that point. If there is no evidence of malfeasance, and let me emphasize default is not evidence of malfeasance, but there are elements of default could, which could be criminal in nature. If you, you know, took the money out of the company and put it in your own uh, personal but assets, yeah. that would be malfeasance and that should be punished. Okay. Mr. Chidambaram, can I get you in here? No, okay, you don't want to get in. Uh, Arun Shori, can I get you in here? One of the points that uh, the governor made, he said that a lot of people understand that you need to do reforms, but the problem with reforms is that, you know, you can't really get elected. So you were in a government which did a lot of reforms. By the way, you never got re-elected either. So do you have a point to make or a question to ask? Yes, that is exactly the case. Th that is one point, that the beneficiaries do not know that they will benefit ultimately, but those who will be dislocated now are well organized. They see the problem just now. But I think one of the uh, failures of successive governments which compounds this problem is that they do not explain. Explain, explain, explain. That doesn't happen. There is an imperial um, sort of thing of just uh, there's something has been done and that's it. So I think there is uh, something to be added to what you were saying. And maybe to do an orchestra of things. And sometimes one reform cannot be done, but it, let us take a privatization of BSNL cannot be done or of Air India cannot be done. But you open up the sectors and that moves things forward. There, that conflict is not as uh, severe. There's some union problems will come, but by explanation, by mobilizing others. So I would think that the political class is not as doing as much as it should in this regard. So on, on your suggestion, there are 23 new banks coming into the banking sector, two of which are already in there. Yes, yes. So that very is, good, very that good is step uh, forward. Uh, uh, very good I step think forward. Up the sector. Uh, just as it's a very good step forward to uh, appoint a group which will select the uh, persons who will direct the banks. That's a very good um, proposal. Absolutely. Thank you. Surjit, uh, you know, since you, there was almost a, a dialogue going on between the two of you, so would you like to add to it? No, actually. Oh, just just a quick, you know, you, you made the point that the governor is right on the fiscal deficit. You completely disagree with him on interest rates, so why don't you? No, I don't actually. Okay. But that's another well, time for another well, case. Well, already. Uh, and to monetary policy around the world. Um, and only lately ha that has come to India, is to what extent are policymakers and central bankers confused or not recognizing that the world has changed in terms of inflation? Now, you alluded to that in your talk. With the low inflation that we have seen in the Western world for now for 15 years, this, I think, whether you use the phrase is messed up policymakers or monetary policy, we have only just started to see low inflation, uh, only two years, if you will. So I'm not alluding to India, but to the rest of the world, including China. This is a major problem that policymakers have to face. No, you, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, I think the uh, question is whether this, as you said, this is structural, it's embedded, and therefore, all your attempt to elevate inflation by a variety of actions that you're taking is really flailing around with uh, very limited effect and has the effect of building up risks in the rest of the system. I think we need to, we need to ask this. But I will, I will tell you that to me, uh, to my mind, the most dangerous part of this all 
is that, uh, and you will perhaps uh, uh, just as me on another issue, I'll come to that, is that we fitted central bankers with blinkers by saying your mandate is to stay within this inflation range. For the central banks in the West, the lower bound of the inflation range has become so traumatic because they're staying below it. And everybody's saying that you can always, you know, uh, achieve, get higher inflation by spraying the money around on the streets. Take the money, go to a helicopter, and throw it out on the streets out of the window, and people will then take the money and buy stuff, and of course, inflation will pick up. So the point is that they're being uh, really pilloried by the press that you can always raise inflation, you're not doing it, so you're failing on the job. The reality is that whatever they've tried hasn't really worked. And I'm not sure that a helicopter drop would also work uh, because it may create more anxiety. You know, where's this money going to go? How, what's it going to be worth? Let me save some more. Yeah, I was just going to add to that that they have tried helicopter money and it doesn't work. And I think this is for India, this is a time of fantastic opportunity that given that we have brought our inflation rate down, and I think it will continue to go down, so we'll await your monetary policy on that issue. But I think this is a time where we are at the greatest advantage. No, I, I, I agree on that. I think we are in a very sweet spot. And, uh, you know, the, the tenor of my talk is let's not... Uh, wasted by doing the wrong things, let's do the right things. We can increase productivity, we can increase growth in a variety of ways, and we absolutely should have higher growth. We need higher growth. We will have higher growth. Ishar, you had a question? Yes, thank you. Um, given that the stressed assets of our banks, and particularly our public sector banks, really is uh, a very, very serious problem, and given that, given the political economy pressures on public sector banks to lend uh, uh, to specific, uh, you know, projects and all, how critical is the privatization of banks to really achieve the end result? Because you could recapitalize banks today, but if the pressures are going to be there. Ten years later, we will again be staring at these banks which will have acquired new stressed assets. So what do you think can be done? And is privatization of banks really crucial to get to the end point? Um, I, think, I, th I think one of the paradoxes is the government that is willing to privatize is also probably a government that doesn't necessarily want to direct banks uh, to do this and that, because if it got a lot of rents from doing that and enjoyed doing it, it would probably not want to privatize. So we're, we're in a situation that we are looking for a good government, uh, which sees little value from directing the banks and then wants to privatize, assuming privatizing is the way. But there's another way if you have that good government, which is improve the governance of the, of the, of the banks and enhance the health with the idea that some that eventually uh, prove to be uh, amenable uh, could go the private route, right? So it doesn't have to be a big bank, one-shot privatization. You could have a mixed system, but some entities which are better in the private sector rather than the public sector could move that way. The key for both is better governance. Uh, I am not sure today if you privatized everybody, you would immediately get better governance uh, because you would need a, a, a strong set of uh, governance structures to ensure that the money in a private bank is not whisked away somewhere uh, because the private promoters do that. So we really need uh, whatever the solution to build better governance. And that's where you know, entities like the Bank Board Bureau that Mr. Shori mentioned uh, are ways to improve the governance. By all means experiment. I think the government is, is uh, thinking of taking further action on IDBI which would be a way to see, does this also work? Can we build in governance structures here so as to preserve the health of the banks, improve the health of the banks, improve the viability of the employees? Employees are always very scared about privatization, but it may be actually a better route for them. So let us, let us see. But I would say that's not immediately the need of the hour. Governance is the need of the hour. Just one quick interjection here. that It's also true that when we talk about private banks having lower NPAs than public sector banks, 
A lot of those private banks are not lending to industry or infrastructure. No, no. So, you know, we tend to believe that they're a public sector, they're inefficient, that's why they got higher N NPAs. Actually, they got higher NPAs because they, they took risks, they helped the economy grow also. That's also a fact. Right. I, I think the truth is, is somewhere in between in this. Uh, I mean, uh, people who say they were forced into this area or they had no option, and therefore they have NPS. Well, some of the NPS yeah, journalists could have been in black and white. better managed. Some of the NPS could have been better managed. But it is true that they took greater exposures there because there was that was the need of the R. And so we shouldn't completely deny that. And, and also some private banks which had moaned into infrastructure have similar kinds of difficulties. Yeah, you, were talk you want to get into that question on NPS, do you? I think what we've been hearing from the governor since the first day he took office was two messages. One is no more bad credit, and we have to give some sort of safety landing for legacy credit. And I think that um, just being an intermediary, what we have found remarkable is in the last six months or so, banks have been coming to us much before the NPA is about to hit them, anticipating, wanting to know how they can better structure their existing environment, and actually now looking to talk to each other and find a joint way of trying to tackle the problem. I think rea realization has dawned that this problem is not going to go away. The bank is not going to allow any more restructuring and evergreening. And I think everybody is having very sensible conversations. More importantly, I think with the last few months, the promoter is probably finally realizing that he's got equity value of pretty much near zero. Uh, and with the strategic debt restructuring, he can just be basically out-owned. Uh, so it'll be interesting times. Ajay, you want to get on this? Sorry, yeah, you want to get on? Yeah, you had a question? No, I have a question. Okay, okay. Can I? Yeah, sure. sure. Yes. Um, Dr. Rajan, my, my question for you is on the relation between the reforms and growth. Um, I belong to a country, by the way, I'm the ambassador of Italy. I belong to a country whose uh, prime minister is saying every day that the growth <coughs> lar <coughs> largely, <coughs> sorry, largely depends uh, on reforms. Um, of course, the situation in Italy and in the Eurozone is not comparable with the situation in here today. But assume, and of course, I wish the government to, have, uh, to be fully successful on, on its uh, uh, reforming agenda, but assuming that the government won't be able to approve important laws like uh, GST, uh, land bill, and support. Uh, which is your guess on, on, on the impact on growth? So do you think that this could have an impact on growth? And, and the, second, uh, the second point, as you were referring before to uh, uh, coalition with sympathetic industrial countries, um, I just want to seize this opportunity to highlight the relation that could be explored between the made in Italy and the make in India. So as I guess that, of course, is much more on the side of my duty than on yours. But I think that there are uh, interesting aspects there because, of course, we are the second manufacturing countries in Europe and we can share a lot of experience. And I was just interested in knowing uh, your, your sense on that. Thank you very much. Oh, well, I, I, I do agree there are lots of uh, commonalities between our two countries. Uh, one of my close friends, co-author, is Luigi Zingales, who uh, I think uh, we, we get along very well. So I, I think there's some, some reason for that. Uh, there are countries, uh, there are lots of commonalities. Uh, and we certainly should explore that. Uh, I, I do want to say the following, that I believe we are in danger of getting fixated on a couple of reforms which are really important, but we get fixated on them at the cost of ignoring a lot else that is happening. And that is creating the push on a variety of fronts to move forward. Let me give an example. The Aadhaar bill that was passed uh, yesterday uh, could be extremely important in a variety of, of, of ways uh, to reduce the cost of subsidies, um, enhance the quality of lending, uh, improve the quality of tax collection. All these could be major steps forward, uh, enabled by this particular passing of the bill. Uh, similarly, what happened with gas prices, of course, I'm not an expert there, but I will just say that it seems as if from the reaction, this will enable a lot, lot more of investment in oil and natural gas. So I think that the 
art of, uh, of managing is to move forward on every front where you can. Uh, of course, there are the big issues like GST, but if you can't move there, move elsewhere, we will still get uh, strong growth. And, and, and I believe that this, this range of actions that are being taken uh, will together contribute, uh, including the actions of the budget, to over time strong, uh, strong growth for the country. If I can get, just get Javed Akhtar and Shabana Azmi in here to move this debate just from the pure, dry economics, would you like to make a comment or ask a question? Can we get a mic there? Sure. You can decide who comes first. You know, it's like asking Dr. Rajan to comment on films. If he's willing to do that, then I'm willing to, to talk about the economy. I'll pass that. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. You, you want to make... Well, let me find out where is my bank and then I'll talk to you about it. <laughs> Sorry? Yes, you had a question, ma'am. Good evening, Dr. Rajan. Um, from a mergers and acquisition point of view, uh, not as an economist, um, we're talking about India in a global scenario. When do you think India will be ready to reduce its capital control over currency? When are we ready for full capital account convertibility? Um, we don't really have... Uh, uh, when, when I look at what, what are we preventing, okay? Uh, inflows into equity, there's no bar. It can come in, well, some places uh, you need permission to go above 49%. That's usually given. Uh, most of our private banks, there's 74% holding of uh, foreign entities in those banks. So is that a bar? I don't think so. Um, as far as taking money out, every family of four can today take a million a year. Uh, how many families have that kind of money? Million dollars, not rupees. Uh, not very many. So pretty much, uh, I should say to Zia, all my lawyer friends are the ones who constantly asking how they can <laughs> invest in uh, abroad. Uh, uh, and, and I have to tell them that there is this facility which is the LRS facility. But it's I'm surprised she needs to know. What's that? I'm surprised she needs to know. <laughs> no, no, she's asking for her lawyer friends. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but so you can take out. You can't take out hundreds of millions at one time. Uh, but if you want to buy companies abroad, you can do that. You can take hundreds, in, in fact, billions have gone out in F external uh, foreign FDI. Some of them, uh, which are less than four times your net worth and less than a billion dollars, taken out without even asking us. So in terms of capital account convertibility, we have a fair amount of openness already. One place where we limit is, is on debt inflows. And that too, we limit it at the really short end because we don't want to subject the country to greater instability at these turbulent times. And we limit it in terms of how much government debt. We don't need people who, I mean, we like foreign investors, but we don't want foreign investors who want to stay at the very short end in risk-free securities, earning the interest differential. They don't necessarily help the economy. Down the line, when we open up fully, we let them in also. But today, uh, when we have some risks, uh, that's the last place that we, we want to open up. So, um, any last one question, Mr. Raja? Mr. Raja would like to ask you, can you give this mic to Mr. Raja, please? Dr. Rajan, uh, actually, you ended your talk saying you are open to ideas. I'm also open to ideas. Uh, we both agree there should not be any intolerance to ideas. Having said that, since 1990s onwards, till today, one of the critical issues, not only in global economy, in our own economy, is the growing inequality, unprecedented. You are right when you talk about productivity, creation of wealth, everything. But how do you address the unprecedented growing inequality? Occupy Wall Street was the result of the inequalities that American economy witnessed. And we are witnessing similar situation in India. And how do you address this issue? I do not think privatization will be panacea for all our problems or evils in our society. And uh, when we talk of fundamentals of economy, I think uh, still in country like ours, public sector has a role to play 
and a crucial role to play that includes banking sector also. So I would like to listen to your response. How do you address the growing inequality? So I, I don't disagree at all with what you said about the public sector. I think the public sector in a mixed economy can be very useful, uh, sir, in the, in, the, in, the, in the economy. Um, I do think that uh, whether public sector or private sector, uh, what is important is they be efficient in what they do. Uh, and uh, that uh, to some extent, whatever services we require of them, they provided at, uh, at least cost. Uh, and so we have to work on that. That's why I said governance is, is extremely important. We don't want to misgovern private sector. We don't want to misgovern public sector either. Um, I think that uh, the pressure is on us to create jobs. To my mind, the best form of equalization is when somebody has a good job, and with that good job comes the pride of doing work for which they're getting adequately compensated. And, and so all our thinking has to be how do we spread good jobs across the economy, not jobs which are funded by the taxpayer as make-believe jobs, but real jobs where they actually do productive work. And so that, to my mind, has to be the focus, which means we need to focus on creating the infrastructure because, as you know, around every one of these roads that comes up, you see all sorts of uh, economic activities springing up. Uh, if you build a road into a vill village through the Gram Sadak Yojana, you find that you find dairy farming picking up in the village, you find uh, small shops starting, you find uh, uh, poultry being kept. So there are lots of ways in which we can create jobs. Infrastructure is one of them. Easing the ability to start businesses. A lot of our uh, employment is self-employment. Do we need to harass that, that self-employed uh, uh, person? Or can we allow them to build their business and grow slightly larger, uh, creating jobs for others? So that's, that's another aspect. Education. How do we spread education? Today, if you give somebody the right education, they can move from poverty to first world status in the span of 10 years, if they have the right education. How can we make sure that more people get that kind of education so that they can actually uh, be world beating in terms of their, uh, in, in terms of their jobs. And, and uh, finally, I think financial sector is also extremely important. How do we ensure that people have access to financing for their education? How do we ensure that once they get educated, they have the ability to start a, a small business uh, with a loan? Um, uh, you know, these are all, I think, to my mind, the ways we can move forward. But I would say that, uh, that for a poor country, uh, I think the best way of moving our poor people forward is to, is to spread the jobs. Thank you, Dr. Rajan. I think you've uh, left us all a lot of food for thought. And I think the, you know, a lot of people will differ from you in your policies on monetary policy or exchange rate policy. But you know, the big lesson to take back, to go back to a report you once wrote, it's about 100 small steps. That you know, don't worry, don't look for that big bang fix for anything. So you've got a gloomy policy environment, you've got a gloomy economic environment, but you can make these small changes in efficiency and they can go a really long way. Thank you so much. I think we've had a great first Ramnath Memorial Lecture and I hope this is the first of many. Thank you very much all. I would like to call uh, Anand Goenka, our full-time director and head of new media, to present a little memento. To